So how do we actually learn to talk? What does that process look like? Well, we begin by listening. Even before we're born, we can hear sounds from the mother, from the father, and from other individuals within the womb. Uh, and beyond birth and into the, develop, uh, the primary years, we, we continue to listen and we start to echo what we hear. Uh, so when dad says baba, the baby starts to say baba as well. Uh, with some prompting, with some coaching, we learn that when I'm holding the bottle and I say baba, the child gets access to that bottle or baba. And then the child can apply that on their own without necessarily using the parents. So the child learns that when they want the bottle and they uh, need to, to facilitate that request through a parent because they can't simply go to the refrigerator and get it themselves, they say, baba. Uh, so what we mean by verbal behavior is behavior which is mediated with re by reinforcement through somebody else. Uh, we differentiate that from mechanical behavior. If I wanted a drink of water, I could go to the water fountain myself or go to the refrigerator and get a drink on my own, and we would call that mechanically reinforced. Uh, or I could access verbal reinforcement and ask somebody else, the waiter uh, or a friend. It would be inappropriate for me to get my own drink of water at a restaurant and perhaps at a friend's house. But through verbal behavior, uh, I can still get that same drink of water. It's just mediated through somebody else. Uh, typically occurring during the first two years is when we um, hear most of our, acquire most of our language skills. Uh, but then throughout life, uh, language is something that's um, ever-changing. And so recently we've come across new words that we couldn't have used many years ago, like Googling, uh, which now has a function as a verb. Uh, ROFL, anybody recognize that one? Likely so. Again, five, ten years ago we wouldn't have known what it meant. Uh, but thanks to the advancements of technology and text messaging, we can say, oh, they're rolling on the floor laughing. Uh, one of them that, that gave me fits for a long time was IMHO. Anybody know that one? Uh, it's in my humble opinion, and uh, it, it always prefaces something, so it's hard to get the context for what, when would you use I-M-H-O, but uh, have fun with that one. Send it to somebody else. <laughs> so the question is, when does slow to talk become a language delay? We heard the one parent on the video saying, well, this will get better in a year, and a year went by and didn't necessarily get better. Maybe two years and didn't necessarily get better. Maybe three years. So when does that slow to talk, a child who hasn't just yet come around, and we know there's precedent for slow to talk. Uh, James Earl Jones didn't speak until he was five to seven years old. Uh, they say Einstein didn't talk at all for the first five years, and uh, perhaps there are some autistic attributes to be attributed to, to some of these uh, geniuses themselves. But then why do some children fail to learn language altogether? What accounts for this? And largely, we can say that those students that have poor language skills have more or more extreme autistic behaviors. Well, let's take a look at some of the language milestones. Uh, in utero, again, the baby attends to the sound of your voice. From birth to three months, we can distinguish between cries. We know when the child's wet versus when they're hungry versus when they're in pain. They have different cries uh, to which we can attend to. From four to six months, we get some babbling and language play, and that's when we can really start to uh, encourage the use of some of those language skills. From seven to 12 months, stringing together different sounds, we can begin to use some inflection in the tone of voice. They start to kind of mimic the patterns of our own speech based on what they're hearing again. At one to two years, child can understand, but maybe not necessarily follow no. They can start to use 10 to 20 words, uh, including names. Combine words such as daddy, bye-bye to identify that somebody is leaving the room. Uh, they can wave goodbye and play patty cake. Make the sounds of familiar animals. Uh, they can give a toy when asked. Use words such as more to make once known. They want additional or repetition of the same thing. Uh, they can identify body parts pointing to nose, eyes, uh, toes, etc. And then the child can receptively follow commands, such as, go to the other room and get me the, your favorite giraffe, and they can, they can follow those requests. As the child gets older, they can able, they're able to uh, use and respond to more advanced verbal behavior, uh, identifying additional body parts, uh, an armpit, something that's not necessarily taught early on. Um, carrying on conversation with the self and dolls. And it may not necessarily be meaningful, but they can approximate 
what a conversation between mom and dad or mom and somebody else sounds like, and they can mimic that with their own dolls. They can ask questions like, what's that, and where's my, to identify access to their preferred items. We can use uh, two-word negative phrases to request being taken away from or removing ac access from an aversive item. We put firm plurals by adding S, so book becomes books. Uh, I can give up first name and hold up an amount of fingers to uh, identify how old they are. We can combine nouns and verbs, mommy, go. Uh, so we're getting gradually more complex. We have a greater mean length of utterance is what we refer to that as. Uh, we understand uh, simple time concepts. So last night, something happened, and tomorrow, something else is going to happen, and different than now. Uh, and refers to self as me rather than by name. Now again, these are kind of general milestones. Uh, and they, your own children, if you have children about this age, may or may not have all of these skills. And really the point of this is that they aren't necessarily going to develop these skills on their own, but they, they need the help and the support of a verbal community to acquire this information. Three to four years old, the child can tell a story. Uh, we have a uh, sentence length of four to five words, so much more complex. Uh, vocabulary overall has nearly a thousand words in it. Uh, we can name at least one color. Understand yesterday, summer, lunchtime, tonight, little big. So these are relational concepts. We follow multi-step requests like put the block under the chair. And we know his or her last name, name of street, um, and several nursery rhymes. Again, start to recall more complex information. By four to five words, a child has a sentence length of four to, uh, four to, five, four to five years. We have four to five words. Uh, we use past tense correctly. Again, some more relational responding. Uh, vocabulary of nearly 1,500 words. Uh, point to colors, red, blue, yellow, green, etc. We can identify different shapes. Uh, understand in the morning, next, noontime. Uh, can speak of imaginary conditions such as I hope. Uh, things that we don't necessarily are going to come true or we don't understand the controlling relations for, but uh, we can uh, identify um, those imaginary or supposed things. And, mass, and they can ask many questions, excuse me, ask many questions such as who and why. Uh, and then five to six years, and I promise we won't go beyond this, um, we have a sentence length of five to six words, uh, vocabulary of around 2,000 words. We identify objects by their use. Uh, so features, functions, and classifications of those objects. We know spatial relations, prepositions, on top, beneath, far, near, behind. Uh, knows her address, um, knows common oppositions, like big and little, uh, near, far. Understand same and different, uh, can count to 10 objects, and can ask questions for information. So as the child progresses, we get more and more advanced language, but it's not simply due to that the child's been around longer. They've had a greater time to interact with other people. Uh, the conditions under which they have formed their language are a direct result of how it functions for that child. And so for those of you that have had children or work with children, uh, there's research to document this, but almost everybody knows uh, that, child that, that uh, girls acquire uh, language at a significantly faster rate than boys. And again, this was demonstrated empirically in, in the 70s and, and multiple times before and after that. Uh, but is it a coincidence that boys who have a harder time acquiring language or are slower to acquire this language are also almost five times more likely to be diagnosed with autism? Can we just say that's simple coincidence? Or is there something to the, the um, gender issue that boys are slower to develop language? So of importance to us, as those who can provide some type of intervention, is what do we do when those milestones aren't met? We can look at them and say, yes, this child's on track, uh, or no, they're falling behind. But what do we do if they, if they're, if they um, aren't meeting those milestones? Well, typically, the first thing we do is we wait. If you go to a pediatrician and say, I'm a little worried about their language, unfortunately, in many cases, but the first thing they tell you is, oh, don't worry about it. He'll catch up. He's just a slow talker. And then six months later, we go back and they say, don't worry about it. He's only two years old. He'll catch up. So we wait some more. 
And this is a quote of a mother of a child with autism, who says, the pediatrician typically denies or underplays the problem until the, the child's condition deteriorates to the point at which the pediatric neurologist or a psychologist or a psychiatrist will finally confirm the validity of our fears. And so we then provide that child with a label. Well, they, fi they failed to acquire language. They failed to acqui acquire language. We did the typical things, we waited. And now we can say, well, because they failed to acquire language, we can, we can appropriately classify them with a neurological disorder. But let's go back to what is talking. How does it serve the child or the individual who speaks? From a verbal behavior standpoint, again, it's access to reinforcement that's mediated by somebody else, but that's pretty technical language. Maybe we can break that down a little bit. Some cases, uh, some theories say that language is innate, and that's what separates us from the other uh, species uh, of animals. Uh, again, uh, as we talked about compressing cows and compressing humans, um, there's an issue of continuity of species, and language falls within that same continuity. Certainly, uh, our basset hounds at home have difficulty with their verbal behavior, but they can respond somehow. Uh, they can let us know that their, their wants and needs need to be met. We taught a basset to ring a bell to let us know when he wants to go outside, and largely that falls into the same classification as verbal behavior. The dog couldn't open the door on his own to go out, so that had to be mediated by somebody else, and when the dog rang the bell, we would open the door, and the dog's ring the bell was reinforced by access to the outside. So how do we break language down? Largely we're taught sentences, phrases, uh, words, letters, and other uh, grammar, syntax, punctuations. We look at these as kind of the topographical means. When in between two commas is what we call a phrase, or, or from the first uh, capital letter to the punctuation mark is what we call a sentence. Uh, but a functional approach to language looks at it a little bit differently. So for instance, we can take the word fire, and we can say, what is its meaning? Well, according to the dictionary, it can be combustion. It can be one of four medieval elements. We can say it's to dismiss an employee, or to discharge, discharge a gun or another weapon. But it doesn't necessarily tell you uh, what a person means when they say fire. What's missing from this? The context, exactly. The context in which it's said. Uh, and perhaps a fancier way of saying context is what we refer to as stimulus control. Under what conditions does somebody say the word fire? If I were to just yell out fire, it could have many different reasons. And, and the way I, in which I yell out fire might lead you to either duck or run out of the room. Um, or engage in, in various other behaviors, run for the fire extinguisher, pull the alarm, et cetera. So let's consider a few different circumstances and look how the word single, single word fire serves different functions. So in a fireplace, you say fire, and what happens? Again, let's consider you to be a, a two-year-old, three-year-old, and we get a lot of praise. Yeah, you're right, that is a fire, good job. That's what we call generalized reinforcement. If I were to say ready, aim, and you say fire, to me, typically get a very loud bang. Suppose a dish towel catches on fire while cooking and you say fire. Well, hopefully somebody rushes in to help put out the fire. Uh, if you see the words F-I-R-E written on the board and you say fire, again, from an instructional standpoint, nice job, you sounded it out. Those vowel consonant E words are, are very difficult and you appropriately uh, change from the, the small vowel sound to the large vowel sound, and you didn't phonetically say the E, there's, there's all sorts of stuff going on there. So you would likely get lots of generalized reinforcement and praise. Uh, the smell of smoke, and you yell out fire, it might lead a lot of people to leave the building. If I say fuego, and you say a fire, and somebody might say, nice job translating, that's good. Uh, I can say, oh, um, what's that stuff called? It's hot, it's, it's orange, it burns, um, and you say, Fire. <laughs> that's right, that's the word I was looking for. It's right on the tip of my tongue. Uh, or, and perhaps the, some of the most basic elements, we just say, say fire, and you say fire. Nice job, you said what I said. It's a, what we call a, a coic. <laughs> so the various ways that this language operates is what we call uh, according to their verbal operants. Um, and on your slides, it's a little bit different than what I've got here. Yours is more strategic in the way it's set up. Uh, but the, ver the various verbal operants are what we call the mand, which is controlled by uh, 
uh, sorry, deprivation or um, uh, desire to have access to something else. Um, attacked, which is controlled by environmental stimuli that we either see or hear or taste or smell or feel. Uh, the intraverbals is the overarching class, and within that we have sequalics. We have uh, a different categorization of duplic, which um, I will try to stay away from technical language, but it has point-to-point -point correspondence, but no formal similarity. Uh, I'm sorry, this one has both formal similarity and point-to-point -point correspondence. So when I say fire and you say fire, that's what we call an echoic. Uh, or if I see the word fire written out and you write down the word fire, that would be called uh, copying text. Uh, and then a codic is when we're, we have the same point-to-point -point similarity, but we don't share um, uh, we don't share some of the the actual um, uh, formal similarity. I'm, I'm saying that wrong again. I apologize. Uh, the textual and the transcriptions, where I say a word and you write it down, uh, we're going across modalities here. So instead of my vocal verbal language leading to your vocal vocal verbal language. Um, now I'm saying something and you're writing it down, or I'm seeing print and I'm saying it out loud. So we're, we're going across modalities or learning channels. But we can largely look at these as, uh, this is kind of the, the overall uh, breakdown of all the verbal operands, but we kind of break these down into the, most, the three basic elementary ones, which are the man, the tact, and the intraverbal. So if we look at the man for a minute, we can say it's derived from the words demand or command, the root mand. Uh, it's often thought of as a request, such as asking for pizza is a man when it's under the control of getting pizza. So if I want pizza and you have pizza and I ask for it, we would say that is a man. It's a request to get pizza. A nice way of thinking about it is that it specifies its reinforcement. The same way that the baby wants the bottle and they say baba to get access to that. It specifies what it is that the child wants to strengthen that response in the future. Uh, mending pencil specifies pencil as the reinforcer. And asking for directions specifies directions uh, as the reinforcer again. Now that's different than a tact, which is under the control of properties of the present environment. Uh, and that could be objects, events, um, sounds, actions, etc., which are with which you are currently in contact. And again, we can see that contact shares the root tact in there. Uh, it's often referred to as labeling. And so we can say that seeing pizza might lead me to say pizza, not necessarily because I want some, uh, but because I see it sitting there. Oh, look, there's a slice of pizza. That's odd. Um, we can see that uh, seeing a pencil and say, uh, signing the word pencil would just be a tact. It's not necessarily because I want the pencil. I'm just, I'm just saying it because something in the uh, present environment is controlling that response. Uh, smelling smoke and writing smoke might be a way to get somebody to leave the room. Uh, hearing barking and typing dog, again, because you've heard this sound, then it leads you to say the word uh, dog. Um, it, it controls some of that response there. 